Om Jnana Timirandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha uh, So now I will begin to read a, a selection of quotes from Srila Prabhupada with overlapping themes, but more or less in some kind of order. Uh, what would be called sexist statements. Uh, Srila Prabhupada, speaking in a lecture in Vrindavan in 1976, sometimes we received the complaint in foreign countries that you keep your women like slaves. I replied, we do not keep our women as slaves. They're very respectful at home. That means that the Others are very respectful to them. The sons offer their highest respect to the mother. The husband gives the topmost protection to the wife. So these quotations shouldn't be used to mistreat women. And actually that's a fact in traditional uh, Indian families that the, as I described in some detail in the Women's Masters or Mothers Seminar, that uh, the mother is given uh, the highest respect, mm. looked after. Parents are looked after, not sent, not sent off to uh, old people's home, senior citizens' homes. They must have that here in Germany. They're just put away, just left to rot and die. But in, uh, in Vedic culture, in any culture all over the world, until they discovered this idea of locking up the senior citizens, the elder people looked after by their children. It was just the most normal thing. Um, and very much respected. So, um, one verse, Srila Prabhupada, among the many verses that Srila Prabhupada often quoted was, uh, from Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, text 32, I believe it is. Mam hi partavya pashritya ye pi syuf papa yo neha. Striyo vai shas tata shudras tepi anti paranga team. Krishna says, uh, those who take shelter of me, even though they be of lower birth, uh, papa yoni, it means, uh, born as a result of sinfulness, um, including the Vaishas, the mercantile community. Uh, well, the Vaishas, their business is Krishigo Rakshavanijam. So they can be farmers, cow protectors, or merchants. Uh, the Shudras and the women, they can attain, uh, the, they can attain me, they can attain the highest destination, Krishna says. So Srila Prabhupada often quoted this verse. Now, um, this gives the full opportunity to everyone, even though the, uh, as we shall see in the course of these quotes, that the uh, woman's birth is not considered on the same level of, as that of a man in terms of opportunities for, uh, well, particularly in terms of opportunities for self-realization, generally the understanding. But Krishna says, those things don't matter. Everyone can attain the topmost destination. In the verse after that, Krishna says, King puna brahmana punyas bhakta raja shayas tata anitya masukam lokam imam prapya bhajasvamam. Then Krishna says, and what to speak, uh, King puna brahmana, of the pious brahmanas, and the kshatriyas, who, the devoted kshatriyas, who in this miserable and temporary world worship me. In other words, it's expected of those who get a higher birth, it's expected that they have a better opportunity for self-realization. But Krishna says that anyone who takes shelter in me can, uh, attain me. And then the conclusion of the chapter is in the verse after that, which is, anyone? 
Manmana bhava mad bhakto mad yaji mang namaskaru mame vaishasi yuktvaiva matmana mat parayanaha. Therefore, the conclusion is that whoever we are, whatever we are, wherever we are, uh, we should think of Krishna, become his devotee, bow down to him and worship him. Uh, and being completely linked with him, uh, one can uh, become completely absorbed in Krishna and completely devoted to Krishna. So uh, this Mamhi Partha verse, those who are making charges of sexism, they would say there's also sexism because it's condescending and says that women are less than men. So our reply to that, of course, it's not much use to speak with such people, but our reply is that, well, yeah, there are different grades according to mm, karma. People get different situations. It's not that everyone's the same. Some people have Janmaishvarya, Shuta Sri, birth, high birth, uh, wealth, learning, good looks, and others don't, and there are gradations in between. So for uh, self-realization, the male form is generally considered to be better. But, Krishna says, anyone who takes full shelter in me, they can attain the supreme destination regardless of whatever birth they have taken. So Srila Prabhupada, one of the many, many quotes that he gave on this uh, topic uh, actually, this Varnashram system is meant for bringing the man in the lower status of life to the higher status of life. It doesn't matter if one is born in a low-grade family. That is also said by Krishna. Mang hi parthavya parshritya yepi syuf papayoniha. Papayoni, lower grade. Sriyo vaishastata shudraha. In the human society, women, the Vaisha and the Shudra, they are considered in the lower status, not very intelligent. Uh, and again, that's in human society. Uh, in devotional society, uh, anyone, whatever their situation, if they chant Hare Krishna, they're in a much better situation than anyone who doesn't chant Hare Krishna whatever the material situation may be. Then, uh, from a lecture in Rome in 1974, the duty of a Vaishnava is to reclaim these fallen souls. Just like Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Mang hi Krishna says, anyone who comes under my shelter, never mind he is the lowest of the low, low-born. Formerly, even the woman in the mercantile community and Shudras, they were all, thank you, they were also considered as papayoni. Papayoni means whose brain is not very developed. That is papayoni, blunt-headed. What is that? Uh, then the devotee reads the verse: "O son of Prita, those who take shelter in me, although they be of lower birth, women, vaishyas, merchants, as well as Shudras workers, can approach the supreme destination." Prabhupada. So the supreme destination back to Godhead is back to home is for everyone. It is not that God, God means for everyone. God does not say only the Brahmana class of men, please come here. Others all reject it. No, he is inviting everyone, even of the lowest of the lowest, low born, papayoni, women, shudra, or vaishas, everyone. Then from a lecture in Hawaii on February 3rd, 1975. It doesn't matter what he is, which family he's born. It doesn't matter. Krishna says, Mang hi To take birth in a low-grade family or animal family, these are called papayoni. Krishna says that it doesn't matter if one is born in the papayoni, low-grade family. It doesn't matter. Mang hi In the human society, striya, shudra, sata, vaisha. Even woman and shudra and vaisha they're also taking the category of papayoni. Papayoni means their intelligence is not very sharp. That is called papayoni, and a brahmana means to become very, very highly intellectual. That is called brahmana, because he'll understand brahman. Mm. Uh, 
uh, reading from Srila Prabhupada's purport to Bhagavatam, Canto 2, chapter 7, text 6, what we can call as the spiritual reason for this, what might appear to be sexism. Woman is the real binding force in material existence. If one wants to get freedom from the material bondage of conditional life, he must get free from the attraction for the form of woman. Woman, or the fair sex, is the enchanting principle for the living entities, and the male form, especially in the human being, is meant for self-realization. The whole world is moving under the spell of womanly attraction, and as soon, as soon as a man becomes united with a woman, he at once becomes a victim of material bondage under a tight knot. The desires for lording it over the material world, under the intoxication of a false sense of lordship, specifically begin just after the man's unification with a woman. The desires for acquiring a house, possessing land, having children, and becoming prominent in society, the affection for community and the place of birth, and the hankering for wealth, which are all like phantasmagoria or illusory dreams, encumber a human being, and he is thus impeded in his progress towards self-realization, the real aim of life. Here Srila Prabhupada is paraphrasing the verse, Pungsastriya Mithuni Bhava Metam, etc. You know that verse? Tayora ho hridiya granti maho Ato griha kshetra sutapta vitaya janasya moho yamaha mamete Another often quoted verse of Srila Prabhupada in which he states, uh, sorry, in which Rishabdev states that um, attraction, uh, sexual attraction between male and female Umsasriti Sriya Mithuni Bhavme Tamtya. Well, Srila Prabhupada translates it that it's, it's the basic principle of material existence, which forms a hard knot on the heart. It forms, in other words, that, um, one becomes very strongly materially attached. And from that attachment comes attachment to uh, a home property, attachment to one's country of birth, to money, to children and well relatives. And in this way, one becomes uh, bewildered, thinking in terms of I, me, and mine. So Srila Prabhupada is paraphrasing this in this purport. And later on in this purport, it's quite a long purport. I'm just taking excerpts from it. Um, Srila Prabhupada writes, Combination with women is an unnecessary burden that checks self-realization. Woman is a stumbling block for self-realization. So that's uh, an underlying uh, principle. Why uh, it, Elsewhere, Srila Prabhupada writes that the whole purpose of Varnashram is to help free one from sexual desire, which binds one in this material world. It's, it's meant... It's a social arrangement that is meant to elevate us to the platform where we can become spiritually advanced. It's Varnashram is not in and of itself a spiritual enterprise, but it helps to bring us to the platform of uh, self-realization. It's a help in that. And the main obstacle in self-realization is the attraction between male and female. Those who are in the male form, they are supposed to tackle this attraction or this uh, binding in the material world by becoming detached from the desire for association with women. That will, be, according to one's eligibility, uh, one may do so from the platform of brahmachari, from the platform of a grihasta, a vanaprasta, or a sannyasi. For a woman, she is uh, recommended to serve her husband. Uh, all these points will be discussed. Uh, and in, generally for women, um, renunciation is not uh, recommended. 
However, as Krishna repeatedly says in Bhagavad Gita, whatever situation one may be in, if one directly takes shelter of Krishna, then one goes um, immediately to the topmost platform of self-realization. Still, the Varnashram system should be followed by most people, even if they're practicing bhakti, uh, as a safety net, because uh, to attain full self-realization immediately uh, is not possible for most people. Then, uh, from a purport in the third canto, Srila Prabhupada writes, the human being is a social animal and his unrestricted mixing with the fair sex leads to downfall. Such social freedom of man and woman, especially among the younger section, is certainly a great stumbling block on the path of spiritual progress. Material bondage is due only to sexual bondage and therefore unrestricted association of man and woman is surely a great impediment. So, uh, now here's an anecdote reported by Giriraj Maharaj. Um, well, it's actually Yamuna Devi Dasi, uh, one of Srila Prabhupada's earliest disciples and, uh, well, she passed away about a year ago, something like that, and uh, was well known and respected as a very advanced devotee, disciple of Srila Prabhupada. So, um, Giriraj Maharaj, in his recent Vyasa Puja offering, I believe it was, uh, recounted what she had told him, some various anecdotes. So, she explained that she always thought she had as much right as anyone to walk or sit close to Srila Prabhupada. And generally when he spoke, she would sit in front of the Vyasa San at his feet. She never really considered that men should walk or sit closer to Prabhupada and women further away. She joined in on the west coast of America in around 1967, where Srila Prabhupada to quite some extent, went along with the hippie ways, not to the full extent, but in many ways. Um, he didn't try to impart a lot of education to his disciples there. It was a, many people, just, it was a different atmosphere to the East Coast, to New York, where the whole, there were less devotees, and the whole atmosphere was more strict. On the West Coast, there were many devotees, and it was quite loose. Prabhupada initiated very freely, um, and men and women mixed up and everything, whereas on the East Coast, from the very beginning, they were quite uh, understanding about this principle, which is understood in all religious societies everywhere, all over the world traditionally. As I remember going to the Catholic Church, uh, as in my childhood, the men would be on one side of the church and the women on the other, and the women would cover their heads until they had Vatican II, and then everything went to hell. Uh, <laughs> and uh, suddenly in Islam and uh, Buddhism, I was talking to Bhakta Klaus this morning, his, his experiences in Theravada Buddhism, uh, there's no free mixing, but uh, from what I understand, then the devotees there on the west coast of America, they, they never even thought about these things, that men and women shouldn't mix up, and Srila Prabhupada didn't emphasize that at that time. So um, the movement had been like that in the early days, like a family. In Allahabad, however, this was at the Kumbh Mela, Srila Prabhupada was there, one of the sannyasis explained to Yamuna that in India the women sat apart and that she should too. So during the next morning's lecture, she sat at some distance from Srila Prabhupada. Later that morning, Srila Prabhupada noticed her passing by his tent and he called, Yamuna, come in here. She entered and offered obeisances and before she got up, he said, So you don't want to hear any more? Yamuna burst into tears. Prabhupada. Uh, Yamuna burst into he tears. Hearing from Prabhupada was her life. 
Where were you this morning? he asked. Yamuna told him exactly what had happened. Prabhupada was silent. That, as she told me, was a turning point in her life. It changed her whole orientation in Krishna consciousness. She suddenly had the realization that she would not always have Prabhupada's company. And goes on to explain how she'd heard many times about Vani and Vapu, and one has to learn to serve the Vani as more important than the Vapu. And so she went away and left Prabhupada to practice serving by reading his books and following his instructions and not relying solely on his personal presence. Many years ago, I met uh, Gagamuni Prabhu, who was one of the, also one of the early disciples of Srila Prabhupada, but who had, at that time, uh, gone outside the society of devotees and was doing some business or something. And he was, I met him and he was telling me various anecdotes from about Prabhupada and he said that but actually you you are closer to Prabhupada than me because he said to me you have you have remained in his service I I didn't want to stay because I I said I left shortly before Prabhupada I left the society of devotees shortly before Prabhupada left this world because for me Krishna consciousness was my personal association with Prabhupada and I saw I, I wasn't going to get that and I that was all in all for me so uh, Yamuna had that realization. Now, an, an, an interesting point here is that um, there was a paper written that would be uh, around the year 2000. And that stated that, well, in the early days of the movement, the men and the women, they all mixed up in Kirtan and Prabhupada didn't say anything. But later the sannyasis went to India and then they changed everything. And Prabhupada, Prabhupada didn't change it, these sannyasis changed it. Uh, things like this, uh, Yamuna sat close to Prabhupada and then the sannyasis said to her, well, you shouldn't sit very close because in India that wouldn't be considered very good. And Srila Prabhupada did teach many of these things to his disciples in India. He had to teach everything to them. Things like, don't touch the, the glass of water when you're drinking it, because people will blame me that, that sadhus are supposed to follow the culture in the best possible way, but even ordinary people don't touch the glass of water when they drink from it. So all little things like that. Um, Srila Prabhupada taught his disciples these cultural points. Uh, and... Uh, Certainly, Srila Prabhupada saw that these changes were taking place in the movement, that men and women became separated in kirtan and in class and in everything else. But he never protested about that. We hear, we see here Prabhupada was silent when Yamuna told him. That could be interpreted in various ways, but however we interpret it, we can understand that Srila Prabhupada didn't oppose that. He didn't say, no, no, you should come and sit close to me. He didn't oppose that. So, uh, yeah, that is a fact in, in cultured society. Certainly, sannyasis don't mix intimately with women, even if they're their disciples. Even men don't mix intimately with their daughters, if their daughters have reached the age of puberty. Um, it's very strict in this matter. So, moving on, uh, reading from a morning walk in January 1977, uh, which Srila Prabhupada says there's no equal rights. And he doesn't like feminism. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, I condemn everyone that you're all dogs and hogs. And United Nations is a pack of dogs barking. That's a fact. And in Chicago I said, that all women, you cannot have freedom. You have got only 34-ounce brain and man has got 64-ounce. I told them. So I became a subject of very great criticism. Trivigram, women's liberation. Prabhupada, I denied. No, you cannot have, I told them. One girl in the airship, she was seeing me. She was seeing like, and Prabhupada makes some gesture. Uh, that must be referring to the stewardess. I asked her, give me seven up. 
And she said, is it locked up now? So I frankly said that, no, you cannot have equal rights because your brain is 34 ounces. Actually, that's a fact. Where is woman philosopher, mathematician, scientist? Not a single. Dr. Patel. Apart from that, they are made for a particular mission. Prabhupada, how can they have equal rights? Up to date in the history, there is not a single woman who is a great scientist or a great philosopher or great. Dr. Patel interjects, Madame Curie was a Prabhupada, all bogus. It's an interesting comment, seeing as Madame Curie was a uh, scientist. <laughs> and uh, what was it? She X-rays, was it? No, no, X-rays was a German. It was uh, Louis Pasteur and the... What was she doing? Anyone? Well, I can't remember now. What was her contribution? She's one out of... Not the... So, Dr. Patel, you are getting too harsh on them. Prabhupada, no. How can I give you equal rights because your brain is less substance? That's also been challenged, that this whole thing of brain size and all this kind of thing. Uh, Dr. Patel, we cannot degrade our mothers that way. Prabhupada is not degrading, is, is accepting the actual fact. So that's an interesting thing. Dr. Patel, who's also... Um, from superficially Prabhupada is from the background of a cultured Indian gentleman and Dr. Patel is from that background. So there's the idea on one hand we respect mothers, respect women as mothers. On the other hand, um, well, all these other quotes. So those... Those who act as mothers are respected and protected as mothers. Uh, but at the same time, it's to be understood that they have a particular role. They're not supposed to take the, the role of men. and For that matter, men are not supposed to take the role of women. Mm. So here's another, I mean, this, this is kind of thing. It, I can imagine it must be very hard on women raised in the modern society and uh, probably our movement at some point in time will come under under uh, great criticism of this. It's actually amazing that the things that are in Prabhupada's books about, there's so many things, it's amazing it hasn't come under scrutiny by the public because there are some pretty you know, old things about not going to the moon, and moon is further away than the sun, so many things. It's quite amazing that it hasn't come up for public scrutiny yet. So from a lecture in London in 1973, Prabhupada says, Vishvasam naiva kartavyam strishu raja kuleshu cha Don't trust women. Strishu means women and politicians. Never trust the politician and the woman. Of course, when a woman comes to Krishna consciousness, that position is different. We are speaking of ordinary woman. Because Krishna says in another place, Striyo Vaishastata Shudra. They are considered women, Vaisha, the mercantile community, and Shudra, and the worker class. They are less intelligent, Papayoni. When the progeny is defective, then they become less intelligent. Srila Prabhupada makes a distinction when they take to Krishna consciousness, but the, ge but the general point is, it says now what would be called a sexist statement, not to trust a woman. There is a narration in the uh, Mahabharat that um, when Yudhishthir came to understand that Karna was actually his elder brother, and that Kunti had kept this a secret. He cursed that the women will never be able to keep secrets <laughs> uh, from that time. That would have changed the whole. The whole story would have been completely different if it wasn't for that. If she hadn't hidden that. So uh, why why not trust? Um, well, and uh, now we come into. Uh, I, I'll give a whole series of quotes in uh, which Srila Prabhupada says that women are less intelligent. There is a quotation which I couldn't f 
find somehow or other. I had to put this all together and there's a lot of notes. I didn't have that much time to put it all together. Where Srila Prabhupada said that women are considered less intelligent because they're, they're more uh, inclined to sense gratification. So we find in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that, um, that, uh, jnana vijnana nashanam, this karma, material desire, covers one's uh, knowledge and understanding. So, even though it is seen that uh, in some ways uh, uh, women can be very intelligent in terms of academics, although these IQ tests, uh, I recently read that that someone who can do well in an IQ test, it doesn't really show that one has got very high intelligence, it just shows that one is good at answering questions in an IQ test. Because actual intelligence and answering various questions in IQ tests may not necessarily be the same thing. And and there are different kinds of intelligence, of course, also. Vaishas are called less intelligent, but they have good intelligence for making money, which Brahmanas don't have. Shudras may also be very intelligent in some ways. Just for instance, uh, uh, writing computer programs. It's a, it's a Shudra kind of skill. Uh, or uh, this morning we were talking about, about art. Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael. These, that's, they have a very great skill for doing that, but that's a Shudra activity. So, uh, anyway, I better just get on with this because I still have many pages to read. Um, but yeah, all of these points, they, they can be discussed in more detail, but I'm just putting out these points with a little commentary because, uh, again, the point I'm making that there is a, a very different outlook on gender roles within Vedic culture than there is in the uh, prevailing culture in Germany today, or most of the, or all of the Western world. And that, the Krishna conscious or Vedic cultural perspective uh, would be strongly condemned as sexist by those who subscribe to the politically correct worldview in uh, the Western world at the present time. It's, it's always important to remember that when we're talking about the prevailing theories and this and that, we are largely talking about vi- about Western culture. And it's not all over the world. It, it's definitely influential all over the world, but there are large parts of the world where uh, Western culture is still not the prevailing culture. That means... In the Islamic world, in general, they don't want this Vedic culture. Is one reason they don't want this Western culture. Is one reason why a lot of people are very upset with the whole uh, Western world in the Islamic world. And the, um, <clears throat> in much of Africa, in China, well, in one sense they're they're eager to accept it, but in another sense they're proud of their own culture and they think this Western culture is just something new. We have a much more ancient culture. So anyway, the point uh, Srila Prabhupada makes uh, here again and again, less intelligent. <coughs> Srila Prabhupada writes, now the next few quotes I'm giving are from Bhagavatam purports. Women as a class are no better than boys and therefore they have no discriminatory power like that of a man. This is stated in relationship to Draupadi. On one hand, Srila Prabhupada praises Draupadi for being uh, forgiving, but on the other hand, uh, he says that even though she, she's such a great personality and a great devotee, that uh, she shouldn't have been so forgiving to Ashvatthama because he deserved to be punished. This was the context. Um, then a discussion, Srila Prabhupada discussing about Shiva and Parvati, when Chitra Ketu made an, an insulting joke about Shiva sitting with Parvati on his... Parvati was sitting on his lap, and 
Chitra Ketu made a, a joke and Shiva tolerated but Parvati didn't. So Srila Prabhupada commented here, here is the difference between male and female that exists even in the higher statuses of life. In fact, even between Lord Shiva and his wife. Lord Shiva could understand Chitra Ketu very nicely, but Parvati could not. Thus, even in the higher statuses of life, there is a difference between the understanding of a male and that of a female. It may be clearly said that the understanding of a woman is always inferior to the understanding of a man. In the Western countries, there is now agitation to the effect that man and woman should be considered equal, but from this verse it appears that woman is always less intelligent than man. Uh, in first canto, the woman class, who, by nature, who are by nature less intelligent, the shudras and the woman class do not undergo any sangskar save and accept this ceremony of marriage. The less intelligent classes of men, namely women, shudras, and, and, and unqualified sons of the higher castes are devoid of necessary qualifications to understand the purpose of the transcendental Vedas. Yeah, so, um, all right, that's fairly self-explanatory. Um, from the Bhagavatam, from the text itself, um, and there, I'll give many quotes later, that it's not just Prabhupada in his purport saying these things, but uh, it's in the text of the Bhagavatam and many other Shastras also. Um, Prahlad is describing how he got this spiritual knowledge. And he describes how he learned it in the uh, womb of his mother. Narada inst superficially instructed his mother, Kayadu, but he was actually speaking to the child in the womb. And in the text of the Bhagavatam, Prahlad says, because of the long duration of time that has passed and because of her being a woman and therefore less intelligent, this is translation of the Sanskrit, my mother has forgotten all these instructions, but the great sage Narada blessed me and therefore I could not forget them. <clears throat> Then uh, from a lecture on Bhagavad Gita, Srila Prabhupada said, to understand Brahman is not the business of tiny brain. Alpamedasa. There are two Sanskrit words, Alpamedasa and Sumedasa. Alpamedasa means having little brain substance. Physiologically within the brain, there are brain substance. It is found that the brain substance in man is up to 64 ounce. They are very highly intellectual persons, and in women the brain substance is not more found than 34 ounce. You'll find, therefore, there is no very great scientist among the women, so it's a little repetitive. No, among the women, no mathematician, philosopher, you'll never find because their brain substance cannot go. Uh, then... Uh, in, in another lecture, uh, generally women less intelligent than man. You cannot find any big scientist, big mathematician, big philosopher among women. That is not possible. Although in, your, although in your country you want equal status with man, freedom, but by nature you are less intelligent. What can be done? Um, now, about bad character. Srila Prabhupada explains elsewhere that this may not apply to all women. Um, but uh, anyway, I'll read it. This is from Bhagavatam text. A woman's face is as attractive and, and beautiful as a blossoming lotus flower during autumn. Her words are very sweet and they give pleasure to the ear. But if we study a woman's heart, we can understand it to be extremely sharp, like the blade of a razor. In these circumstances, who could understand the dealings of a woman? Purport, woman is now depicted very well from the materialistic point of view by Kashyapa Muni. That's an interesting statement, materialistic point of view. Uh, Srila Prabhupada continues, when a woman's bodily features are attractive, when her face is beautiful and when her voice is sweet, she is naturally a trap for a man. The Shastras advise that when such a woman comes to serve a man, she should be considered like to be like a dark well covered by grass. 
In the fields there are many such wells, and a man who does not know about them drops through the grass and falls down. Thus there are many in such instructions. Since the attraction of the material world is based on attraction for women, Kajapa Muni thought, under the circumstances, who can understand the heart of a woman? Yeah, there's a, a statement there. Attraction for the material world is based on attraction for women. So that again comes to the uh, Pungsastriya, how the attachment to home, wife, children, family, country, bank balance, all these things that comes develop some attraction to woman. If a woman is called stri, which comes from the same from the same verbal root as uh, the term vistara, which means expansion. Mm. Of course, uh, a wife can also be stri in the sense that she can help to expand the uh, spiritual atmosphere of the home. Such expansion is desired. But in general, uh, it, it's seen that, uh, yeah, we, we, when one has a wife, one requires to have so many uh, accoutrements, paraphernalia for home life. Kajapa Muni, going back to the purport, Kajapa Muni thought, under the circumstances, who can understand the heart of a woman? Charnakya Pandit has also advised, Vishvaso Naivakartavya Strishu Raja Kuleshucha. There are two persons one should not trust, a politician and a woman. These, of course, are authoritative Shastra conjunctions, and we, therefore, we should therefore be very careful in our dealings with women. Srila Prabhupada continues. Sometimes our Krishna conscious movement is criticized for mingling men and women, but Krishna consciousness is meant for anyone. Whether one is a man or woman does not matter. Yeah, Srila Prabhupada was criticized among his god brothers for uh, allowing both men and women. Of course, he was criticized by his god brothers for just about everything, but one of the things was uh, that he allowed men and women to both participate in the movement and he had he arranged for young women to stay in the ashrams which which Goryamat was unimaginable but Srila Prabhupada wanted to as Srila Prabhupada said Krishna consciousness meant for everyone he wanted to give an opportunity to everyone um, within traditional Indian culture it's it's women are not allowed to stay in ashrams uh, the ashrams are meant for that. They're meant for men to live separately from women. But Srila Prabhupada gave that opportunity. Uh, Srila Prabhupada continues. Um, interestingly, all, pretty much all the things that the Goryamat, those Goryamat people who criticized Srila Prabhupada for, they eventually adopted themselves. They, you'll find in many of their mats, they also have ashrams for women now. Uh, they they said you can't have Western devotees or they can't be they can't be Brahmanas and they also have them and they criticize us for they give Westerners initiation even if they're not following in many cases and uh, they criticize that are oh, using chemical dye for red cloth instead of rock dye and they all use chemical dye now also and so many things. So, uh, Krishna, Srila Prabhupada says, Krishna consciousness is meant for everyone, whether one is a man or woman does not matter. Lord Krishna personally says, Sriyo Vaishyas Tatha Shudras Tepi Yanti Parangatim. Whether man, whether one is a woman, Shudra or Vaishya, not to speak of being a Brahmana or Kshatriya, everyone is fit to return home back to Godhead if he strictly follows the instructions of the spiritual master and Shastra. So in the verse following this, Kajapa Muni continues, uh, to satisfy their own interests, women deal with men as if the men were most dear to them, but no one is actually dear to them. Women are supposed to be very saintly, but for their own interests, they can kill even their husbands, sons or brothers, or cause them to be killed by others. Purport, a woman's nature has been particularly well studied by Kajapa Muni, Women are self-interested by nature and therefore they should be protected by all means so that their natural inclination to be too self-interested will not be manifested. That's another reason for protection. The one reason was 
given in the uh, Bhagavad Gita, Srishu Dushdarshu Varshaya Jayate Varna Sankara, that if women are not protected, then they'll be exploited and unwanted progeny will result. And another reason is to uh, protect them from themselves and uh, if they're too much self-interested. Women need to be protected by men. A woman should be cared for by her father in her childhood, by her husband in her youth, and by her grown sons in her old age. This is the injunction of Manu, who says that a woman should not be given independence at any stage. Nahi Sriyam Svatantra Marhati. Women must be cared for so that they will not be free to manifest their natural tendency for gross selfishness. There have been many cases, even in the present day, in which women have killed their husbands to take advantage of their insurance policies. This is not a criticism of women, but a practical study of their nature. That's even more condemning, isn't it? Such natural instincts of a woman or a man are manifested only in the bodily conception of life, When either a man or woman is advanced in spiritual consciousness, the bodily conception of life practically vanishes. We should see all women as spiritual units, ahang brahmasmi, whose only duty is to satisfy Krishna. Then the influence of the different modes of material nature, which result from one's possessing a material body, will not act. The, the The Krishna consciousness movement is so beneficial that it can very easily counteract the contamination of material nature, which results from one's possessing a material body. Bhagavad Gita therefore teaches in the very beginning that whether one is a man or a woman, one must know that he or she is not the body but a spiritual soul. Everyone should be interested in the activities of the spirit soul, not the body. As long as one is activated by the bodily conception of life, There is always the danger of being misled whether one is a man or a woman. The soul is sometimes described as purush because whether one is dressed as a man or a woman, one is inclined to enjoy this material world. One who has this spirit of enjoyment is described as purush. Whether one is a man or a woman, he is not interested in serving others. Everyone is interested in satisfying his or her own senses. Krishna Conscious, however, provides first-class training for a man or a woman. A man should be trained to be a first-class devotee of Lord Krishna, and a woman should be trained to be a very chaste follower of her husband. That will make the lives of both of them happy. So and I'll read more quotes about that later, uh, how the woman is supposed to be a follower of her husband, which is hated by, the, by uh, people... With a modern outlook, they call it sexist. And that will make the lives of both of them happy, which is observably... I, I, I had this experience in when I went to Bangladesh. First of all, I went in 1979. I spent a few years there and became very intimately acquainted with the culture. Um, that was the days before... Most of most of Bangladesh had no electricity, um, no roads. Most people had never seen a car, or a TV, or a, what we would call a doctor, and so many other things. Um, and so the the culture was very uh, traditional. And I saw that even though uh, there are very distinct social roles of men and women, that the women are very much uh, respected and loved and uh, they're, they're happy to be in their role and you, the feminists would say, well, you could say that ignorance is bliss, but anyway, I discussed this in the Women's Masters or Mothers in some detail, so I won't go over it again now. Uh, how the, by fulfilling their natural feminine role, they they actually become happy, whereas if they try to take another role, then they're always disturbed. They're always looking out that, oh, you're, you're, you're not treating us equally. They become all the time 
sada samadvigna dhyama sadgaha. Their mind is all, always disturbed because they accept that which is not proper to be correct. So another uh, sexist statement coming up. Women in general are very much sexually inclined. This goes against the modern way of thinking. That it's actually men who are very sexually inclined, but throughout history, it's always been considered that that um, it's the women. Indeed, it's said that a woman's sex desire is nine times stronger than a man's. It is therefore a man's duty to keep a woman under his control by satisfying her, giving her ornaments, nice food and clothes, and engaging her in religious activities. So this uh, protection. It doesn't mean just locking up at home and putting locks on the door, but the protection, a major part of that is by uh, engaging the woman in religious activities, which means the man himself also has to be engaged. Otherwise, how can he engage her? Of course, a woman should have a few children and in this way not be disturbing to the man. And this feminist would hate this. Unfortunately, if the man becomes attracted to the woman simply for sex enjoyment, then family life becomes abominable. But in the modern world, if, if there's any idea of family life, it's all based on sex enjoyment. That's the base. That's what they call love. But the whole, the whole understanding is so completely different that family life certainly Sex enjoyment is there in family life, but the basic principle is one of responsibility. This, even if it's not Krishna conscious, the uh, the, the responsibility should be there. Uh, one one accepts a wife, uh, and one accepts a great responsibility. It's not just well for enjoyment. So it's a completely different outlook. Um, that women should not be leaders. That's already Srila Prabhupada has mentioned in the... Uh, well, several times he came across this. Here's a specific quote about that. Uh, here he's talking about being the head of a country. Unless rogues, thieves, and other demoniac people in the state are afraid of the executive head who rules the kingdom with a strong hand, there cannot be peace or prosperity in the state. So Srila Prabhupada is here recommending uh, dictatorship. Let's read it again. Unless rogues, thieves, and other demoniac people in the state are afraid of the executive head. There should be fear. The dishonest citizen should be afraid. Uh, Thus it is most regrettable, Srila Prabhupada writes, when a woman becomes the executive head instead of a lion-like king. In such a situation, the, the people are considered very unfortunate. And in the modern age, there's democracy. A man or woman or anyone can be elected as a head of state, but no one even expects to be secure in the state. The, no one should pay taxes unless they can walk out of their house leaving it empty with the door open. <laughs> there should be so you should be so confident that there's no thief because if there's any thief, they should be punished immediately. Chop off their hand. That's the system. Sharia law is there also. Same thing. They, they, but no one. They, they'll vote different parties. But no, no, uh, no politician can guarantee. No, they don't. They don't even think about it. That the, the, the citizens can be fully protected. They don't even think about it. It's just, just considered impossible. The situation has become so bad in society. Yeah, please. There is a limit. If something, some goods are stolen, at least in Croatia, less than 300 euros. Less than 300 euros, the police won't even bother. They won't even bother, yeah. You can sue privately somebody, you know, who stole Yeah, they won't make any investigation if it's a small, small crime in Croatia. They won't even bother. And in many countries, the police won't take up a case. They they need a little uh, 
encouragement to take up the case, financial encouragement to even take up the case. It's a horrible situation. Srila Prabhupada was for strong government. So, continuing here. Uh, all right. Punishable. Srila Prabhupada quoting Ram Charit Manas again. Shashan ke adhikari means they should be punished. Punish means just like dhul. That means one kind of drum. When the sound is not very hard, dug dug, if you beat it on the border, then it can be a nice tune. Those who play mridanga know that. If the sound is very soft, you have to beat it with a hammer, a special hammer at the edge, and then the sound becomes... Uh, ni- then it becomes nice tune. Similarly, pashu, animals, if you request... My dear dog, please do not go there. Ah. But then Prabhupada says, Hut! Hut! Uh, so, no, my dear dog. So, Sri Prabhupada is saying that just by politely requesting a dog, the dog won't be controlled. Hut! You have to be, you have to shout at it. Similarly, woman, if you become lenient, then she will be troublesome. So in India, still in the villages, whenever there is some quarrel between husband and wife, the husband beats and she is tamed. Prabhupada laughs. In civilized society, oh, you have done this. Immediately some criminal case. But in uncivilized society, Prabhupada is speaking tongue-in-cheek here, they don't care for court or civilized way of, and then the sentence is not finished. From Srila Prabhupada Nectar, Srila Prabhupada said that when he was a young boy, he used to beat his sister once a day. When she got married, he once went to her house and was beating her there, there, but their mother told him, you don't have to beat her now because she has a husband. If she does something wrong, her husband can beat her. (laughs) Prabhupada objected and said, no, this is my relationship with my sister. I must be strict with her. I'm just reading. I'm not advocating. I'm not at all advocating that. Uh, and Srila Prabhupada also didn't advocate that the Vaishnavis should be beaten. But I'm just reading what is here. Uh, in Vedic culture, it's not considered desirable to be a woman as compared to be a man. Um, King Sudyumna, under curse, was converted to a woman at which his um, his uh, family priest, Vashishta, I'll read it, um, upon seeing Sudyumna's deplorable condition that she was transformed into a, to a woman, Vashishta was very much aggrieved. Well, some people nowadays they think, hey, that's great, I got a free sex change operation. <laughs> Desiring for Sudyumna to regain his maleness, Vashishta again began to worship Lord Shankara, Lord Shiva. Uh, the word deplorable here is Srila Prabhupada's insertion. It, it, the text says, seeing his condition, but Srila Prabhupada, as he often does in his translation, he, he inserts some words to help make the context understood better. Uh, then again, quoting directly from the Bhagavatam, Manu had begun, there, there was a sacrifice. Manu was performing a sacrifice for the sake of getting a, a son. Manu had begun that sacrifice for the sake of getting a son, but because the priest was diverted by the request of Manu's wife, a daughter named Ila was born. Upon seeing the daughter, Manu was not very satisfied. He wanted to get a son. Uh, Srila Prabhupada, writing to one of his disciples, um, on the 9th of November, 1975, he states, I know that your wife and Vishalini both gave birth to baby girls. That is the defect. I want male children, but you have no stamina for it. I expected from Vishalini by her belly that it would be a boy. Anyway, never mind. 
The name bridge ladder is nice. Why do the majority of my married disciples give birth to girls? Uh, from what I, I again I couldn't find the quote. I had I didn't have much time to get all this together, all these quotes. But elsewhere, Pra Prabhupada states that we wanted boys because they can be preachers. Uh, then the very next day, Srila Prabhupada wrote to another disciple. I know that your wife has given birth to one girl child. Are all your other children also dasis, or do you have any dasis? We want more dasis than dasis. Now, <clears throat> this kind of outlook, it could be said, can give can raise, give right. <clears throat> we have to be very careful with this because we don't want a female infanticide, female embryo abortion. These are very sinful activities. Mistreatment of daughters, mistreatment of wives who give birth to daughters. Uh, recently in Croatia, was it? Aha, uh -huh, that was um, at the Lika camp. I met one of my disciples from Serbia who had recently been at this, who had recently been in a devotee summer camp in Serbia. And then he came to our devotee summer camp in Croatia. And he noted that in Serbia, the atmosphere there is very different because in the Croatia camp, the whole attitude of the devotees who go to that particular camp is that they're grihastas, but they want to practice Krishna consciousness very seriously. Uh, everyone rises, pretty much everyone comes to Mongolati in the morning, even though it's cold often and uh, everyone cooperates everyone is uh, it, it's in, in it's in a cold area of Croatia it's usually cold even in the summer um, so it's quite austere um, but devotees like to come and we, we have a program without any uh, tricks or frills or gimmicks it's just hearing and chanting about Krishna morning till night so it's uh Quite a strict atmosphere, whereas this devotee... But everyone who comes, obviously, they come voluntarily because that's what they want. Whereas the devotee told me in Serbia that there is... Apparently there's no morning program because everyone stays up late and they they they, they come in all kami clothes and long hair and all, and all kinds of weird seminars, what I would call weird, and he called weird also. Um... <clears throat> And he noted that in the Serbia camp, there were many children, and in the Croatia camp, there were many children, but in the Serbia camp, there were mostly girls, and in the um, Croatia camp, there were mostly boys. He said it was a not not noticeable difference. Interesting, in this regard. So that a, a woman should be married and follow her husband. Nothing remarkable about this in terms of world culture, but it is rejected by uh, modern feminist ideology. Srila Prabhupada's uh, purport to Canto 9, Chapter 6, Text 53 of the Srimad Bhagavatam, as stated in Bhagavad Gita 932, Striyo Vaishastata Shudras Tepi Yanti Param Gatim. Women are not considered very powerful in following spiritual principles. But if a woman is fortunate enough to get a suitable husband who is spiritually advanced, and if she always engages in his service, she also gets the same benefit as her husband. Here it is clearly said that the wives of Sobhari Muni also entered the spiritual world by the influence of their husband. They were unfit, but because they were faithful followers of their husband, they also entered the spiritual world with him. Thus a woman should be a faithful servant of her husband, and if the husband is spiritually advanced, the woman will automatically get the opportunity to enter the spiritual world. So Srila Prabhupada, he often said that the main purpose of our movement is to train first-class men who can guide the whole human society, which would begin with their wives. And then they can give birth to children who can be trained. And in this way, the whole society can be improved. So the man is supposed to be first class and the wife is supposed to be a faithful follower. Often the objection comes that, well, uh, you give me a Ram and I'll be a Sita. 
Uh, where's the first class man? Uh, so uh, definitely, uh, girls who are to be married, they should try to find someone who's a very serious practitioner of Krishna consciousness. He doesn't, it's unrealistic to expect that they will be uh, some super Maha Bhagavad, but if they're seriously practicing Krishna consciousness, uh, then that is a very uh, good match uh, for a woman. So, uh, Srila Prabhupada writes in another purport, however great a woman may be, she must play, this is uh, in relationship to Sukanya, who was the daughter of a great king, and she married a uh, rishi in the forest. Prabhupada writes, however great a woman may be, she must place herself before her husband in this way, that is to say, she must be ready to carry out her husband's orders and please him in all circumstances. Then her life will be successful. When the wife becomes as irritable as the husband, in other words, it may be expected that the husband is irritable. It was the, the case in the case of uh, Chavan, who Sukanyo was married to. He was a very irritable person. When the wife becomes as irritable as the husband, their life at home is sure to be disturbed or ultimately completely broken. In the modern day, the wife is never submissive and therefore home life is broken even by slight incidents. Either the wife or the husband may take advantage of the divorce laws. According to the Vedic law, however, there is no such thing as divorce laws and a woman must be trained to be submissive to the will of her husband. Again, of course, the husband is supposed to be trained in spiritual culture. So... He may be somewhat irritable or whatever, but his uh, basic goal of life should be spiritual culture. Or in Vedic society, everyone is uh, trained in dharma. Westerners contend that this is a slave mentality for the wife, but factually it is not. It is the tactic by which a woman can conquer the heart of her husband, however irritable or cruel he may be. In this case, we clearly see that although Chevan Muni was not young, but indeed old enough to be Sukanya's grandfather and also very irritable, Sukanya, the beautiful young daughter of a king, submitted herself to her old husband and tried to please him in all respects. Thus, she was a faithful and chaste wife. And although she wasn't trying for it, she got her name in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Not everyone gets their name in the Srimad Bhagavatam. But she did so by her uh, ideal behavior. She's cited as an example of ideal behavior. Um, then from the third canto purport, in uh, Devahuti was also the son of a, uh, sorry, the daughter of a king who married a poor Brahmana Rishi. Um, Srila Prabhupada writes, yeah, just to, I'll just emphasize that a bit more, that uh, it might be thought, she might think, well, I'm from a very rich family, and I'm from, my my father is respected by everyone, where this Rishi is just living in the forest, and she's used to good food and servants and everything, and then she just goes into a situation where the husband uh, doesn't provide any of those things and just has a life of austerity. Generally, this kind of marriage is not recommended because uh, the wife shouldn't think herself superior to her husband. But it worked in the case of Sukanya and Devahuti because they were very uh, cultured women. <clears throat> so, uh, reading from this purport, here two words. Here two words are very significant. Devahuti served her husband in two ways: Vishrambhena and Gauravena. These are two important processes in serving the husband or the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Vishrambhena means with intimacy and Gauravena means with great reverence. So these two things might seem to be contradictory, just like we hear about Vaikuntha. In Vaikuntha, Krishna is served with great reverence and in Vrindavan, he's served with great intimacy. 
But here it said that the wife should serve the husband with both. Both with intimacy and with great reverence. The husband is a very intimate friend. So although it said the wife should follow the order of the husband, the husband is seen as a very intimate friend. Therefore the wife must render service just like an intimate friend and at the same time she must understand that the husband is superior in position and thus she must offer him all respect. A man's psychology and woman's psychology are different. As constituted by bodily frame, a man always wants to be superior to his wife and a woman as bodily constituted is naturally inferior to her husband. Thus the natural instinct is that the husband wants to post himself as superior to the wife and this must be observed. Even if there is some wrong on the part of the husband, the wife must tolerate it and thus there will be no misunderstanding between husband and wife. Mishrambhena means with intimacy, but it must not be familiarity that breeds contempt. According to the Vedic civilization, a wife cannot call her husband by name. In the present civilization, the wife calls her husband by name, but in Hindu civilization she does not. Thus the inferiority and superiority complexes are recognized. Srila Prabhupada uses modern, is that Freudian or Jungian language? Anyway, it's a modern psychological terms. Anyone here in psychology? Is that coming from Jung or Freud? I believe that's from Jung. Anyway, what does it matter? Uh, Damenacha, a wife has to learn to control herself even if there is a misunderstanding. Sohride Navacha Madhureya means always desiring good for the husband and speaking to him with sweet words. A person becomes agitated by so many material contacts in the outside world, therefore in his home life he must be treated by his wife with sweet words. We often see that, that, that people are just suffering so much at they, they suffer so much at work, it's very tough, there's so much stress, and they come home and there's more stress. Both the wife and the husband are working, they're both completely stressed out, and then they come back and they both want to just wind down, but instead they, they becomes, they're, they're, the stress of each other collides and it becomes, so there's no happiness in either at work or at home, and it's just a horrible situation. So it's recommended that the, the wife be what they used to call housewife before, before feminists said that to be a housewife is stupid. Uh, now they call it a homemaker. Uh, which is, a, it, it's actually, a, it's a good term in as much as the, in English, there's there's the word house and there's the word home, and they're not exactly the same thing. Do you have that in German? Any Germans here? You have the similar thing, yeah. A house is a building and a home is where you live. Home sweet home, it's supposed to be. <clears throat> so that's largely dependent on the homemaker, the wife who keeps the home clean, Looks after the children. Looks after the children. Whew. Remember that from that outdated, uh, that, that outdated cultural artifact. <laughs> Nowadays, children they 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 know some imaginary imaginary character in a computer game better than they know their their parents. So, uh, Srila Prabhupada, morning, from morning walk in Mayapur in 1976, the women are declaring independent. They are begging door to door to a man, please give me shelter, give me a child, and they're independent. One Indian woman was speaking that, one American woman was speaking that in India the women are treated as slaves, we don't want that. So I told her that it is better to become the slave of one person than to become a slave of hundreds. The woman must become a slave. So instead of becoming... Elsewhere, Prabhupada said that we don't treat them as slaves. If you remember, I just read that. But her attitude is should be that to accept protection. That's the point. So instead of becoming slaves of so many persons, it is better to remain satisfied as the slave of one person. Uh, then our Vedic civilization says, 
Nari Rupam Pativratam. The woman is beautiful when she remains as a slave to the husband. That is the beauty, not the personal beauty. How much she has learned to remain as a slave to the husband. That is Vedic civilization. Kokila Anang Swaro Rupam. The cuckoo, it is a black bird, but why do people love it? Because of the sweet voice. Kokila Anam Swaro Rupam Vidya Rupam Kurupanam. Kurupanam. A man may be ugly, black, but if he's learned, everyone will respect him. Well, in a cultured society. And Nari Rupam Pativratam. And if the beauty of a woman is how much she is devoted and obedient to husband. So it is very difficult. Exactly what Prabhupada meant by that. Meant by, by that, I don't know. Uh, that Srila Prabhupada expected this of his women disciples also uh, is established in the following letter that he wrote to a female disciple in 1973. Krishna has benedicted you with a first class husband. In Vedic society, no girl was allowed to remain independent and unmarried. Independence for women means they become like prostitutes, struggling to capture some man who will take care of her. In this way, the so-called independent woman has to work very hard to make herself attractive by artificially wearing cosmetics, mini skirts, and so many other things. Formerly, the girl would be married to a suitable boy at a very early age, say six years old. But although a girl was married early, she did not stay with her husband immediately, but was gradually trained in so many ways how to cook, clean, and serve her husband in so many ways up until the time of her puberty. So all the time there was no anxiety because a girl would know, I have got a husband, and the boy would know, I have got this girl as my wife. Therefore, when the boy and girl would come of age, there was no chance of illicit sex life. That's the idea. They're married early, uh, they know this is my wife, this is my husband. When they when the girl comes to puberty, the boy's already hit puberty before that because he's older. Then they join together, and there's no chance of illicit sex life. No possibility because they, there's no they don't have sex before coming to puberty, and after puberty they join together, which means also having children at a young age. Srila Prabhupada continues, and the psychology is the first boy that a girl accepts in marriage, that girl will completely give her heart to, and this attachment on the girl's side for her husband becomes more and more strong. Thus, if a girl gets a good husband, uh, Srila Prabhupada defines a good husband now, one who has accepted a bona fide spiritual master and is firmly fixed up in his service then automatically the wife of such a good husband inherits all the benefits of his spiritual advancement. So you are fortunate. Go on in this present attitude. Serve your husband always, and in this way your life will be perfect, and together husband and wife go back home, back to Godhead. Uh, now, reading from uh, another Bhagavatam purport, The chaste wife's duty is to keep her husband pleased in householder life in all respects. And uh, Srila Prabhupada said the main two things are by cooking and sexual satisfaction. And then she should keep us, she should keep the home very clean, she herself should be clean, she should come before her husband dressed very nicely, all these things. So that his householder life is pleasing and she should speak sweetly to him and all these things. And when the husband retires from family life, she has to go to the forest and adopt the life of Varna Prasta. That's also something we can recommend to all the senior devotees, that when you're older, your children are grown up, then you can, husband and wife can do full-time service. Jai! Tell all the rest of our godbrothers and godsisters. Actually, there are many of them. There's plenty of service opportunities. Although Queen Archie became very thin from living in the forest according to regulated principles, she was not unhappy for she was enjoying the honor of serving her great husband. So that's interesting. Even though it may be difficult physically, she was actually very happy. And 
we may find it difficult in so many ways to practice Krishna consciousness, men and women, um, but we should be happy that we have the opportunity to serve Krishna. There's this great maya that devotees have, well, serving Krishna is so difficult. Somehow they forgot that it's much more difficult to, 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 to be in the material world and serve what is that? Bifale shevenu kripana durajana chapala shukala balagi re. That it's very, it's much more difficult, and it's it doesn't give any satisfaction to the heart whatsoever in material life to serve materialistic people for the sake of sense gratification. Somehow we think that well, it's so difficult. I'll just go and live independently, but it's, it's much more tough. And it's, it's much more difficult, and we don't have these. We, we don't make any spiritual advancement from it and we don't have the satisfaction of serving Krishna or being in the association of devotees. Uh, from another purport, Srila Prabhupada writes, a woman's attachment to her husband may elevate her to the body of a man in her next life, but a man's attachment to a woman will degrade him and in his next life you'll get the body of a woman. <sighs> Give that to a feminist. <laughs> uh, yeah, because the man's body is, the, 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 the mentality that goes with it is considered better for spiritual advancement in general. So, uh, general, Srila Prabhupada writes, generally separation between husband and wife is due to womanly behavior. Divorce takes place due to womanly weakness. The best cause for a woman is to abide by the orders of her husband. Uh, many of these points could be discussed in much detail, but I'm not going to now, because there are many, many points, and my main uh, point in presenting these is to state that, well, according to the term sexist, Srila Prabhupada's teachings and those of Shastra are sexist. That is my main point here, without discussing all the details. There are many points to discuss because we don't understand these things. We come from a completely different culture, which... Uh, Srila Prabhupada said it's cat and dog culture. There's no idea of spiritual advancement. The, the whole function of society is that everyone should try to get as much sense gratification as possible. It's, it's simply taking everyone to hell. So a Vedic culture has a completely different outlook. And for that matter, any religious cult, as I've said several times in the course of these talks, any religious culture in the world has a different outlook. The whole idea of marriage, it's a, it's a religious function. It's not just a civil function. It's not a legal function. It's secondarily a legal function. It's primarily a religious function. Everywhere, all over the world. Is or was. So, uh, now the topic of sati. Uh, from first, fourth canto purport. The entrance of a chaste wife into the flames of the pyre of her dead husband is known as sahagaman, which means dying with the husband, or more commonly known as sati. This system of sahagaman had been practiced in Vedic civilization from time immemorial. Even after the British period in India, this practice was rigidly observed. But soon it, deg it degraded to the point that even when the wife was not strong enough to enter the fire of her dead husband, the relatives would force her to enter. Thus this practice had to be stopped, but even today there are still some solitary cases where a wife will voluntarily enter the fire and die with her husband. Even after 1940, we personally knew of a chaste wife who died in this way. About 25 years ago in Rajasthan, there was a, there was a case which became internationally famous. Uh, uh, a young woman, her name was Rub Kanwa. Is there just like an ordinary young woman? Rajasthani woman, not coming from any special, and just kind of. Her husband died suddenly, and uh, she ended the fire. And I, I read some descriptions by f British and other people who had seen this and happening, and they said that the woman would it was voluntary, and they would those who decided to go, they would go, and they'd be completely calm. And they themselves would light the fire with themselves sitting on it. They were completely calm because they, because they had the faith that I'm not the body and I'm following my husband. There are also examples of uh, self-immolation. 
One of the most, actually I can think of three famous photos from the Vietnam War. One is at My Lai with the young girl running away with her clothes on fire thanks to the uh, incendiary bombs dropped by the uh, Uncle Sam's uh, gift to the Viet Cong. Another is of uh, uh, an execution in the street of someone who was supposed to be a spy. You can see there are two photos. One, he's standing there with this look on his face like this with a guy holding his gun. And in the next photo, he's falling over with blood spouting out of his head. And the third famous photo from the Vietnam War was of a Buddhist monk in uh, what at the time was South Vietnam who doused himself with kerosene and just sitting down, doused himself in kerosene, sitting like this, and set fire, and just sitting and burning to death as a protest against the war. So, one who has faith that I'm not the body and I'm going on, uh, they can do that. They can burn. But it's not recommended in the modern age. (laughs) Not recommended in the modern age. We're already burning in the fire of material existence. But the point is that the, that culture was there. The Srila Prabhupada explains why, how, how this could be possible. Um, yeah, this entering, this is in another purport, explained about Gandhari. This entering of a chaste lady into the fire of her dead husband is called the Sati rite. And the action is considered to be most perfect for a woman. In a later age, this sati rite became an obnoxious criminal affair because the ceremony was forced upon even an unwilling woman. In this fallen age, it is not possible for any lady to follow the sati rite as chastely as it was done by Gandhari and others in past ages. Now, the next line is crucial. A chaste wife like Gandhari would feel the separation of her husband to be more burning than actual fire. Such a lady can observe the sati rite voluntarily and there is no criminal force by anyone. When the rite became a formality only and force was applied upon a lady to follow the principle, actually it became criminal and therefore the ceremony was stopped by state law. Ah about widow remarriage. In India still, the system, this from a Prabhupada lecture, the system is followed in conservative families that a widow cannot marry. There is no widow marriage in India. That's among the Hindus, among Muslims it's allowed, and Christians also. Uh, in Manu Sanghita, the law gives the saintly persons Why widow marriage is prohibited? The idea is generally everywhere in all countries the female population is greater than the male population. So the idea is that she has become a widow. She was once married. Now if again she is married, another virgin girl, she does not get the chance of being married. Therefore there is no widow marriage according to Hindu scripture. Another understanding is that she already gave her heart to one man and she can't give to another man. Uh, And a man is allowed... If he is an able man, he can marry more than one wife. Not to simply marry, to get more than, more than one wife does not mean sense enjoyment. The wife must be maintained very respectfully. She must have good house, good ornaments, good food, good servants. In other words, Srila Prabhupada is recommending polygamy here. Uh, actually, in some of the Dharma Shastras, these are the, the law books for Vedic society, a uh, widow remarriage is allowed under certain circumstances. Uh, for instance, if the wife has never, uh, if she's a child and she never lived with her husband, widow remarriage is allowed. Um, if she has actually lived with him but she didn't have any children, it can be allowed. There are some circumstances in which it's allowed. I know uh, one of my disciples in India, before she became my disciple, um, she was married and before they had any children she uh, her her husband who was a truck driver well, not that she was from some very highly placed family he died in an accident and then she just said okay I'm not married throughout life and she comes to the temple every day and 
She lives just close to the temple and does her chanting and everything. So, um, so they they consider that. But there are there are, it is allowed. According to some uh, dharma shastras, that widows can be married. Remarried. So, uh, Srila Prabhupada's advice to some of his disciple women, I already, um, I already read that one letter in which, uh, in which, uh, Srila Prabhupada's talking about following the, the wife should follow the husband. It would like a letter to one disciple. Now, I don't have the reference to this, but it looks like a, a talk, a lecture. Srila Prabhupada writes, Artifici- it's not writes, he says, speaking to his disciple women, artificially do not try to become equal with men. That is not allowed in the Vedic Shastra. Nastriyam Svatantram Arhati. That is called Shastra. You have to understand that woman is never to be given independence. Independence means just like child has to be taken care. Similarly, woman has to be taken care you cannot get your child to go in the street alone. There will be danger. Similarly, according to Vedic civilization, Manu Sanghita, women, women should be given protection. In this way, Acha, this is called Acha. So the demons, they do not know. Acha means proper behavior. Um, I'm, I'm interjecting that. The demons, they do not know what is what, how one thing should be treated. They do not know. In the Western countries, there is no distinction of man and woman. But there is. In other words, there should be. So Srila Prabhupada says this idea of having men uh, equal with women, that is the example of the demons. Uh, That's a social consideration. In spiritual consideration, we see that... uh, Many great devotees, Kunti, Draupadi, uh, they're very great devotees, but still they followed their social role. In our Gorya Sampradaya, there have been some women acharyas, Jan- Janava Devi, Gangamata Goswamini, Hemlata Thakurani. Uh, and the example is there is of uh, Vishnu Priya Devi, the widow of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So they were uh, highly respected. Still, uh, although they were uh, initiating, but they, uh, they, they, they were, uh, very austere is one thing. Another thing, they weren't going out and preaching as such. Anyway, that's another whole discussion. Um, Srila Prabhupada in one morning walk in, um, oh, wait a minute. What I just, whoops, where are we going here? Uh, in one morning walk, Srila Prabhupada said to his disciples, okay, tell me, what are the problems in society? I'll give you the solution. Uh, in this way, Srila Prabhupada would train his disciples how to preach and how to establish Krishna consciousness in the world. So what are the problems? Tell me what are the problems. So uh, Yogeshwar said, here's a problem. The women today want the same rights as men. How can they be satisfied? Srila Prabhupada replied, everything will be satisfied. Just like our women, Krishna conscious, they are working. They don't want equal rights with men. It is due to Krishna consciousness. They're cleansing the temple. They're cooking very nicely. And we can add to that, they're making garlands. Uh, uh, It is... They are satisfied. They never say that I have to go to Japan for preaching like Prabhupada. They never say. Well, actually, Srila Prabhupada did send to Hong Kong um, Burijan Prabhu and his wife as a husband-wife team for preaching. Uh, But he didn't send them. He sent men all over the world, start senders here, and husband and wife teams he sent. But he didn't send women individually to open centers. They never say, this is artificial. 
So Krishna consciousness means work in his constitutional position. The women and men, when they remain in their constitutional position, there will be no artificial, and then the sound becomes blocked out by the traffic. In this now, 16. Bhagavan, yeah, this is a morning walk in Rome. They say that our women are unintelligent because they submit so easily. But actually our women are so qualified in many ways. But these who, girls who simply work in the city can do nothing. They can't cook, they can't clean, they can't sew. Prabhupada, all rubbish. These modern girls, they're all rubbish. Therefore, they're simply used for sense, grat- sense satisfaction, topless, bottomless. Then a letter from Srila Prabhupada to Socharya Devi, who I recently met in Dallas. She uh, came to see me. My God sister. So Srila Prabhupada wrote that. Another item is, you are a married wife, so in that position you should serve your husband nicely, always being attentive to his needs. And in this way, because he is always absorbed in serving Krishna, by serving your husband, you will also get Krishna through him. He is your spiritual master, but he must be responsible for giving you all spiritual help, teaching you as he advances his own knowledge and realization. That is the Vedic system. The wife becomes a devotee of her husband. The husband becomes a devotee of Krishna. The wife serves serves her husband faithfully. The husband protects his wife by giving her spiritual guidance. So you should simply do whatever your husband instructs you to do, however he may require your assistance. Of course, the nature of woman is to be attached to her husband and family, so our system is to minimize this attachment by making the ultimate goal of our activity the pleasure of Krishna. Just try to please Krishna always, and no material circumstances will cause you any discomfort. Uh, interestingly, she told me that many years ago, she had she wanted to follow this, of course, because Prabhupada told her to, but her husband had left Krishna consciousness, and it, she was in a very difficult situation in her old age. So, uh, I'm involved with various devotees, mostly my disciples, in uh, various Varnashram projects, especially in India. And so many things we have to consider. The general direction Srila Prabhupada gave, but to actually establish it is, it's a, it's a big job. Srila Prabhupada said that 50% of my work I still have to do establishing Varnashram. It's a very, very big thing. We can't, just by saying, okay, now women be submissive to men, it's not going to happen like that. Uh, there's a lot of work to do to understand all these principles, how to apply them, how to teach others. So, uh, in, in general, I'm just giving this seminar to establish that what was, what is the, what is the outlook of Vedic culture, of Shastra and of Srila Prabhupada and all these things. But, uh, we also have to intelligently apply this and, and not just presume that now everyone understood it, and then we we have to everyone just uh, the husband just lies back and says, "Okay, wife, do this, do that, do that," and uh, it doesn't work like that. Um, there's, but we should see, we should know what the general direction is and understand these points again to understand. This may sound heartless, all of this, but to understand it all. Uh, I would request, if you want to understand it in more detail, please listen to that seminar I gave on women, masters, or mothers, because I've told that several people who had a completely different outlook, they uh, understood all the points, and they understood why Srila Prabhupada is saying all those things after hearing that seminar. Um, But another important point is that within our movement, uh, because it may be difficult for us to understand all these things. Actually, I don't have any difficulty understanding most of these things. Um, having, having seen it in practice, especially in, in Bangladesh. Um, I also wrote a book about that, uh, that, that glimpses of traditional Indian life. It's not just the man woman thing, but the whole culture, how it works practically. Um, 
Yeah, so our movement, considering the difficulty, and maybe we don't even agree with all these things, we shouldn't follow the example of modern Western society. It's a great disaster for our movement to do so. We should know what is the Vedic culture, why it should be followed, how it is to be followed, and very intelligently try to uh, introduce that. That is my point here. And I'm going to finish there for now. And uh, thank you for tolerating me with all this. And after all, it is mostly quotes from Srila Prabhupada. And um, I'll plan on continuing this tomorrow and maybe the next day if I'm going to finish it all. Still quite a few pages to go through. Hare Krishna, all glories to His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada. Now there will be Arati and after that a procession with Nrishim Hadev on the occasion of the Brahmotsav, the anniversary of the founding of this temple. Hare Krishna, all glories to His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada.